Okay, International Relations Podcast Lecture Number 5 Feminism. Feminism, um, at least in, in the classroom, tends to be something of a somewhat controversial issue. Um, partially because it touches so close to home, to who we are in our daily lives. Um, and usually part of the controversy regarding feminism has to do with our preconceptions of what it is. It seems to cast very um, normative black and white roles over uh, men and women, where men are seeing, seen, being seen as sexist or at least part of a patriarchal culture um, and women as the victims of that culture. And if you understand feminism in such terms, then the obvious response would be to say, well, you know, men are not always um, like that, um, and nor are women as dependent or weak um, as they used to be. Society has evolved substantially, right? However, nor this representation of feminism nor the answer are actually doing justice to what feminism does in international relations theory. And the issues are actually uh, a lot more subtle than uh, just bashing a patriarchal culture um, or uh, uh, fighting for the right of women. Feminism started as a research project, a research school um, in the 1980s, um, where it was res responded to by a lot of skepticism. Um, a lot of people considered feminism to be a non-IR field. Um, others argued that it wasn't scientific enough um, and that it was a normative theory. Um, and even if it got research, uh, support from uh, scholars in uh, the field, um, that support was usually quite dubious, right? So the general tenant would be to say, well, yeah, well, it's nice to include women in the research too, right? Um, and it was sort of generally understood as the women's issues corner. Since the 1990s, though feminism has received much more widespread support uh, and has become uh, a, a well-recognized branch of IR theory, uh, although it still suffers from problems of recognition. Um, particularly in the United States, it can be very difficult for uh, feminist scholars to find, for instance, jobs at prestigious universities uh, because their work is considered to be um, not serious enough, uh, or at least uh, one of the questions that is thrown at feminist scholars very regularly is, well, why don't you come up with testable hypotheses? It seems that you are doing just normative stuff. And of course, this touches upon the question whether IR is a science or a form of activism. And the dominant school in our field is to say, well, you know, uh, we've done away with idealism, we are realistic about the world, so we should try to be as objective as possible, to try to distance ourselves from our objective study and to be impartial in the way that we study it. So we should kick out all forms of political activism from our study of the world. However, feminism, neo-Marxism, post-structuralism, critical theory, all kinds of schools that have become increasingly uh, uh, important in the field during the last two decades, argue that there's actually no such thing as being objective. That uh, we always have a perspective when we study the world. And that the perspective that we have is not politically neutral. If we represent the world in terms of realism, we actually reproduce part of that world in realist terms. That is a political action. It is not a neutral form of analysis. So for a feminist, 
as for a Marxist and uh, other scholars, critical th scholars, the claim of objectivity would actually be very suspicious. Right? Those who are able to claim that they are studying the world impartially and objectively uh, would probably be engaging in a form of research that has become so dominant that no one questions its perspective. Um, that doesn't mean it doesn't have a perspective which has political implications. So rather than shunning a political or uh, a specific uh, perspective, feminists try to be as clear as possible about their assumptions and be very systematic and rigorous in the way they work from their starting assumptions to the conclusions of the research. So what we see is that IR feminism is certainly not just a form of political advocacy but nor is it a form of objective, impartial research of things. It is normatively informed scholarship that tries to be rigorous and exact, but is very suspicious of the claims that others make on objectivity. At the core of the feminist project lies a different conceptualization of power and politics. Traditionally, we have a conceptualization of power in terms of uh, someone being able to coerce someone else, preferably with material means. I have power over you because I have a bigger army and therefore I can conquer you something like that. And this comes with an understanding of the political in terms of elite politics. Politics um, that are uh, defined by political leadership, uh, presidents, states, uh, mat access to material, power, etc. Et Feminism bases itself on a different understanding of power. In feminism, power comes from social structures, or in particularly um, the exercise of social roles. Every society has ways of sort of distributing social roles to social actors, and there are th certain things that are appropriate for certain kind of actors, There's certain kind of behavior that are open for men, for women, for all kinds of groups. The distribution of social roles comes with power. That means that within your social role, you can exercise certain kinds of power. Um, outside of your role, you'll find it much more difficult to be powerful. So your social roles that you have access to um, are for you actually a very important source of social power. And in the distribution of social roles, there are both winners and losers. There are those who have access to more and more substantial forms of power, different kind of social roles that are differently associated with power. And therefore, some come out um, of this distribution more powerful than others. The strength of a society, though, is that generally both winners and losers end up acknowledging the fairness of the situation. So there is a, a, a power distribution system in our societies through social roles that we end up accepting even if we are en uh, ending up with much less power than some others. This is what we call culture. And from this perspective, politics is therefore not about governments or states, or at least not governments and states only. Because the everyday is a social exercise of power relations in which certain roles are privileged or actually uh, underprivileged.
and therefore the important uh, slogan of feminism uh, has become that the personal is political so politics is not just about um, prime ministers and secretaries of states but actually is a part of our social uh, environment on an everyday basis of course there are multiple approaches towards feminism um, in international relations and they can be ordered um, in a very simple way by making a distinction between sex on the one hand and gender on the other where sex is understood as a term the, the, the sort of the sum of, of physical attributes that we have that make us male or female so to say uh, on the other hand gender being the set of social roles that come with the social understanding of what is appropriate for males and females so on the left side on the sex side of things we find um, in innate physical distinctions between what it is to be a man and a woman uh, whereas on the right side we find cultural attributes that are being made towards masculinity and femininity this sliding scale offers us roughly three uh, positions on feminism on the left side we would have uh, on the on the sex side of things we would have um, an understanding of feminism based on human nature that there's simply a set of differences between men and women right this is not a um, very popular um, perspective but it's been used uh, for instance by Francis Fukuyama um, in the 1990s but also more recently by a European commissioner who argued that if the Lehman Brothers Bank would have been a Lehman Sisters Bank the financial crisis would have not taken place because women are simply less greedy than men in the middle position we would have what you could call the glass ceiling argument which is occupied with the question of how women are distributed in society and what makes access for women for certain positions difficult so in this approach people would study um, the access that women have to high political positions for instance that would they would study uh, remuneration why do women receive less pay for the same work um, as as men do um, it would be studying the uh, um, the question of where are the women in high politics etc etc and then to the right on the gender side of things we would not be studying men or women altogether we would study the way in which gender distributes roles of power in our society and where knowledge of masculinity and uh, femininity is intrinsically connected with power so if we cut the left corner off for being generally considered not to be very serious uh, feminism we are left with two kinds of feminism in international relations on the one hand we have liberal feminism which roughly asks where are the women how can uh, we understand the role of women in international politics etc um, etc et and on the other hand critical feminism which asked the question how is IR gendered so let's go over these two for a moment liberal feminism uh, famously asks the question where are the women and this is a question that has two sides on the one hand it asks the question why are there so few women present in political leadership why are there so few female presidents etc etc obviously uh, in recent uh, years we've seen a substantial 
change in this where female prime ministers or even ministers of defense have become a much more um, normal site than before but in the political practices of the last hundreds of years uh, women have been practically all but absent in high positions but the question is also another side um, that's the side of why don't we see what women do in politics why is it that we look that when we look at politics we are looking for men in high places and simply come to disregard the roles of women in those high places or at least in those high spheres as unimportant so the idea is that we actually value the behavior of men in high politics differently than uh, the actions of women so um, people have asked why don't we not study for instance the roles that diplomats wives have when they fulfill all kinds of informal roles that make political uh, negotiations much easier during cocktail parties dinners etc etc why do we not study the role of prostitutes both high-end prostitutes uh, but also low um, lower uh, end that sounds a bit awkward uh, prostitutes that are for instance fulfill all kinds of rules roles within um, uh, conflict areas another question that can be asked is what are the roles of women in development in in developing countries where often they um, are filling a double task of being the breadwinner uh, the, the provider of the family and the caretaker of the family simultaneously while not being rewarded or acknowledged for the double function what is the role of women in the international political economy in international trade etc and what are the roles of women in institutions and finally femin liberal feminism asks about what the role for women is in international relations research um, what contribution of women and feminists can be for the field critical feminism in turn focuses much more on the gendered nature of our knowledge and practices as I mentioned this has to do with the attribution of social roles that come with power and important in this kind of analysis is the distinction between not male and female but feminine and masculine the idea here is that what it is to be masculine is a set of cultural traits that are valued in certain ways and exactly the same goes for what it means to be feminine and we can fulfill both feminine and masculine roles but we'll find that we are much more um, we are much more able to access power if we fulfill the role that is sort of laid out for us in terms of femininity and masculinity so to explain a bit clearer generally and culturally masculinity in Western societies is, is associated with being aggressive outgoing competitive strong conquering etc etc the idea of um, being very outgoing going out of the house hunting gathering conquering is very strongly associated in our cultural memory as being masculine what it means to be feminine is associated with staying in the house fulfilling all kinds of much more positive functions nurturing caretaking life-giving um, cleaning etc etc so this means that femininity and masculinity come with a set of cultural traits that make them intelligible to us and then make them useful to us but they also limit us 
So we have a situation, for instance, um, if we if a woman uh, tries to appropriate masculine um, attributes, such as being aggressive, um, straightforward, outgoing, she will very easily be considered to be something like a bitch, right? Whereas if a man appropriates feminine attributes, he will be very likely to be considered gay or something. So falling out of your role makes it very difficult to sustain social status. And that means that the social power that you have comes largely from the way that you are able to articulate your role. But it means also that your role uh, sort of becomes the horizon of where your power lies. So you are limited in your power by the roles that you can legitimately appropriate. This analysis can be expounded actually a bit further uh, to the level of the state. Charlotte Hooper uh, in 2000 wrote an interesting book called Manly State in which she argues that the state system itself is very much uh, gendered in the way that we understand the functions of states and the international. So states have an inside, a domestic side and an international outside. And the way in which we understand the functions of the states in the inside and outside is very heavily gendered. Whereas uh, for the inside, all kinds of feminine roles apply. Caretaking, nurturing, uh, keeping order, um, giving of life, etc., etc. Whereas we associate the outside of international politics the international side very strongly with, comp with with masculine traits such as competition, power, strength, aggression, etc., etc. So, according to Hooper, the whole state system already comes imbued with gender associations that uh, we not only can study, but that actually shape the actually function of states. Uh, in their international environment. So in this way, gender um, reinforces international relations in certain terms. Okay, let's give um, two or three examples of how feminist analysis plays out in international politics. One of the fields that has been studied extensively by feminist scholars is war and conflict and particularly the roles uh, that come with war and conflict. In the classical understanding of war, we send out men to fight to protect our women and children. And those men come back as heroes. But in practice, it's actually those same men that are responsible for the killing and hurting of women and children. And in fact, if you look at statistics, uh, uh, women and children usually suffer much more from war than men do. So this is an interesting given, particularly uh, due to the fact that the men come back heroes and the women are simply understood to be victims. The understanding of women as innocent civilians actually can enforce the duress that they surrender during warfare. As Laura Schoberg uh, shows in one of her studies, uh, the fact that they are seen as already protected by the state as being innocent victims, um, it is much easier for all kinds of uh, masculine or uh, male actors to hurt them it makes it much more easily accessible to them. And therefore, we see a alarming trend that the idea of powerful women, powerless women uh, are actually be used for political tools through, for instance, widespread use of rape as a political and military weapon. 
So we see that the image of the soldier comes imbued with all kinds of masculine traits and that there is a sort of a contradiction between uh, the man as empowered, as strong, as fighting and actually as a hero contrasted to the role of the woman who is powerless, who is defenseless, who needs our protection, is basically much more an object of protection than anything else. Of course, that doesn't mean that we can't reimagine those kinds of patterns and that sometimes we can actually end up um, iconically, uh, as in the case of, of Lara Croft, for instance, uh, re-understand the role of women in conflict. But the very interesting thing is that the moment that we actually assign masculine roles to the female in this way, uh, we immediately get the problem of um, how do we understand this person to be feminine then? And you see this usually being played out in our cultural practices, in our cultural imaginations, by assigning a sort of a hypersexuality to the woman. Um, that um, that is combining her masculinity with an overdose of femininity so that we actually can sort of make sense of the fact that we have a strong woman here. So this leads to all kinds of ambigu ambiguities. Uh, a very interesting case in point was the, the Abu Ghraib um, prison in Iraq in 2003, where Iraqi prisoners were uh, systematically abused, um, tortured and humiliated by American soldiers. Um, and th particularly the role of one woman stood out, Lindy England, which led to a, a very uh, sort of a wave of confusion worldwide. How could it be that a woman would engage in those horrible abusive practices. Right? Sort of a thing we expect men to do, but sort of falls out of our conceptualization of uh, femininity. Right? And it was very interesting to see the sigh of relief that followed when the news broke out that Lindy England actually wasn't operating on her own in this, but actually that she was in love with her superior who made her do it or at least encouraged her to do these kind of things and that in the end she acted um, in a confused way obviously out of love. That sort of made us understand things better again uh, or, uh, sort of we we had lost the confusion about what it is to be a female soldier and now we can understand her again grasp her again in terms of um, being caught in a pragmatic love of her another interesting way in which we assign femininity um, is by by the uh, representation, uh, representational practices. So in the West, we've got a very, very long-standing uh, representation of the woman uh, through the Madonna and the child representations of Maria and the baby Jesus. Um, and in the hundreds of years of representing Maria with uh, the, the child, we have constantly and um, very powerfully represented her as vulnerable, as holy, as um, powerless, something that needs our protection, something that is very, very pure and beautiful, etc, etc, etc. It's very interesting to think about how we represent vulnerable women outside uh, of our, uh, in, in the practice of international relations, right? Um, and particularly if it comes to, to uh, African uh, the poverty, we see that you, this representation of the Madonna with a child comes time and time back to our public imagination for identifying with someone as a victim that needs our protection. 
a powerless woman with a baby. So we are drawing from our collective knowledge, collective set of representations about what it is to be woman, to actually assign social roles of protectability, vulnerability, etc. on actors, in this case, for instance, um, African women. Something similar but opposite happens too, where we actually assign um, something very much um, more sexual to exotic women elsewhere. A very interesting case in point comes from Cynthia Enlow's Beaches, Bananas and Bases, where she analyzes the United Fruits Company's um, promotional campaigns in the 1930s, which were run uh, by a with a with a Central American woman who was doing nightclub shows throughout the United States, uh, wearing a, a suit uh, that was completely fruity, and she was would be singing, very much fulfilling. Um, the social roles of being exotic, being attractive, being um, sensuous and even sexual, um, etc. So she became this exotic female that we find um, in in faraway places, right? And of course, the contrast of this image of the exotic female with the practice of banana plantations in the same region. Actually, the product that United Fruit Company was selling couldn't be bigger, where we understand the woman to be this joyful, attractive, servile, um, and sensuous exotic being, uh, where, uh, whereas the practice of um, their work was a state of almost slavery um, in plantations that were owned by American um, money. And something similar takes place nowadays in, in the field of tourism, whereas we uh, understand the exotic women on the beaches that serve us our pina coladas as this beautiful, uh, attractive, sensual being that is uh, pleasing for our eyes, so to say, uh, um, where we completely are obvi uh, oblivious of the fact what the working conditions are, the the set of uh, social and economic stress that tourism brings about, the the daily humiliation uh, that comes with receiving rich, uh, spoiled Western people on your beaches every day without you being able to actually go on a holiday yourself, etc., etc. So the representational practices of women in those contexts. Um, are very intriguing because they make something that is imbued with power, very strong power relations, look very pleasant to our eyes. Okay, so some final questions. I mentioned that there is a sort of a mix between a normative position and an analytic uh, project in IR feminism. Uh, what would be exactly the difference between feminism as just a political project and as a research project? Would IR feminism actually seek to address exactly the same issues as political feminism, for instance, would have? Secondly, does feminism suggest that men always win? One of the complaints that men uh, often voice in, in, in my classes on feminism is that it's a sort of a man-bashing practice. Men are bad, men are evil. Hmm, to what extent does that work? Um, in what ways would feminism be open to uh, questioning that kind of power, right? That kind of idea that men always win. Do we agree that the personal is political? And what would the implications be for international relations? Because if international relations is something like the study of international politics or world politics, and the personal is political as well, that could mean that we have access to a really huge field of study um, that is personal or social power. <laughs> 
doesn't necessarily mean that we have to uphold the idea of international relations being state politic uh, oriented. And finally, would IR as a research practice itself be gendered? Could our research be informed in certain ways by gendered practices and representations? And how would that possibly play out? How could it be that our study of the world already comes with certain gendered assumptions? <laughs>